In this episode of the Project Management Podcast, we discuss vision, which is one of the key elements of flow. It is essential to link everything that we do everywhere in the organization to vision if we want to succeed. Hello and welcome back to the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com. This is Premium Episode number 452 and I'm Cornelius Fichtner. Premium means that this episode is reserved for you, our Premium subscribers. Thank you for being here and thank you for your support. In the previous episode, Andrew Kalman gave us an introduction to the concept of flow from the book that he and his brother wrote. And today we are going to open up the book, which as a reminder is called Flow. Get everyone moving in the right direction and loving it. We are going to look at chapter two of the book more closely. This chapter discusses vision and how that relates to the flow concept. Some of the topics you'll hear about are prioritization, aha moments, leadership, how flow can be used in scaling of agile, the importance of trust in the process, and of course, there is always my favorite question at the end of the interview. How can we apply all of this on our projects today? Enjoy the interview. Hello, Andrew. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Cornelius. Thanks. It's great to be here again. So as a quick refresher, before we get into the topic of vision here today, maybe for those who haven't yet listened to our previous interview, the introduction to flow, what is flow in a few words? Flow is the optimal state of high performance. That's how we define flow in the end of our book, Flow in Chapter 9. All right. And Can you then give us an example and explain how to use vision in order to coalesce a project team and get to that optimal state that you have just described? That's a great question. Yes, I can do that. We have many examples of how we do that, but one that comes to mind that's really powerful is one of the customers that we trained in Flow the two directors, so we trained the C-level and the directors. Two of the directors were having a very passionate (laughs) disagreement, discussion over an issue in the company. And we had just gone through in the training, first we took the company vision, and then we took broke it out into departmental visions. And uh, the one director was from finance and the other director was from delivery. And as they were talking, the woman that was the director for the one group, she looked at the other director and she said, well, wait a second. We just worked on vision in these (laughs) workshops yesterday. What's your vision? And so he said his vision out loud and she said her vision out loud. And then they looked at each other and they said, well, in the end, it's all for the benefit of our end users and customers. And so they were able to take a step back and be able to resolve a conflict. And it was a pretty heated conflict. And and they were very passionate in their discussions. But they were able to solve it when they stepped back and said, well, hey, wait a second. Let's, Let's go back to starting points of vision. How are our visions similar? And where is that meeting point that we can quickly resolve this issue? And so they were able to resolve it and move forward, and it was really powerful. For any team, I would be looking at you want to keep your vision big and visible for your team so that when they walk into the project room or to their desks or however you're set up, that they see the vision every day. So you're literally suggesting print it out on a huge piece of paper and, and or you know, a flip chart and put it there. Oh, absolutely. In fact, we, in many cases, we'll hand draw it if we have those big flip charts uh, that are sticky notes. <laughs> we'll take one of those and write it on that. Yeah. Or we'll use some of those. Still, they're quite big, but they're sticky notes. And we'll put them up above 
the team board where we're doing all the work. And so, yeah, we physically make it visible whenever possible. Now, my team, um, one person is in California, the other one is in Canada. We have two people in the United Kingdom. We have people in the Philippines. It's going to be a bit hard for us to put our vision in the team room on the wall. How, how do we do this for virtual teams? For the virtual teams, we would, you can do it by painting word pictures. Are you familiar with the book, Turn the Boat Around? No, I'm not. Okay, uh, Turn the Boat Around was Commander Marquette. He used word pictures for the team because he had a submarine and you couldn't put sticky notes on the wall. <laughs> and so he did it. He has a very elegant way of creating the verbal pictures to create and communicate the vision down through to the team members. Now, if, if I had team members in the areas that you just shared, uh, my assumption is, is that they're probably going to have sticky notes on the wall. I would do a brief exercise with everybody to have them write down the vision word for word and put it up above all of the sticky notes that they have so that it's up there and that they can see it. And so then when they walk into their office virtually, wherever they're at, it's still on the wall. And then let's talk a bit about prioritization as well. That's part of, of the flow concept as well. What has been the effect uh, on prioritization individually, teams, and, and organizationally? Wow, that's, a, that's an awesome question. I'm thinking about when I worked at Nature Publishing Group, and we had that backlog of 260 projects is that the and same one that we talked about in the first interview? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. We talked, yeah. we talked a little bit about that. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm going to dive a little deeper here because remember they had that backlog of mm -hmm. 260 projects. Well, those were broken up into four programs and two portfolios. So it was really eight programs, two portfolios, and all the projects were broken up into that. In the end, I had to go back to the executives that owned each one of those programs and basically force them to prioritize their projects. And I said, okay, guys, you don't get all your projects. You get your top 25. And oh, by the way, we're only going to deliver them in the next 15 months, not the next year. And they're all stunned. They're like, well, but, but we need everything. We need it now. Yeah, everything like, is important, right? <laughs> everything is priority like, one. It's like, yeah, yeah that, and I said, how's that working for you? <laughs> and they said, I said, you, you only deliver 25% of your backlog so far. And that means you only have a one in four chance of doing the right project. Because what I've observed is only those people who are yelling the loudest are getting their projects done. And so you, are, you have people getting things done, but we don't know that they're getting the right things done in the right priority, in the right order. And they looked at me and they were, <laughs> they were like, we hate it when you're right, <laughs> but <laughs> okay. And so it took literally half a year for them to sit down and agree after mud wrestling with them, we prioritized it all and they got the top 100. And we took the other 150, 160 projects and put them on a separate sheet in Excel. And we didn't tell the teams we were throwing them away. We just went back to the teams and said, these are the top 100 projects in these four areas, 25 each, for the next 15 months. And you wouldn't have believed the positive impact that had on the teams. It was like a collective sigh of relief. Of course, I, I can imagine this. It's like, you know, suddenly you go from this heap to, well, <laughs> it's organized. We're only focusing on this and you're going to go, oh, thank God, somebody's I'm finally taking action here. Yeah. And so it was just beautiful to watch that because then the teams were able to get rid of all the noise and focus and deliver. Because if they can't, if they if they don't have that safe space to work in, so that they can focus and deliver, then you end up with only being able to deliver fifty eight projects here. But already the first year we were able to deliver like over seventy, and the next year ninety eight, and the next year one hundred and twenty four. 
And so it, uh, in, in less than two and a half years, we were able to double their project completion velocity. And the executives were just absolutely delighted. And we, we had to go back and go through the priority list with the executives. We did that on a quarterly basis. But, ah, good. So they're meeting on a quarterly basis to review the project backlog and prioritize. Yes. Did I understand that right? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. from the program project perspective. Now, right. I, I had a regular PMO or an agile PMO that was reporting back to them every two weeks. Okay. So the communication flow is that they got 12 reports in that three month period of time so that they knew exactly when we had that next prioritization meeting. They mm-hmm. knew exactly how the team was performing and what's being delivered and what the team's bandwidth was regarding work. So they adapted to that and really loved it, but it was really painful <laughs> for them in the beginning to of do course, that. Yeah. To do it, that it prioritization. Sounds- you know, mm-hmm. once you see the result at the end, it's like, yeah, why didn't we do this earlier, right? Why didn't we go <laughs> that, this road? But it, it must have been really painful and hard and difficult for you to get the C-level executives to go, okay, we're going to try it your way, right? <laughs> um, did you do anything special in terms of communication, in, in terms of helping with low balancing and, and to help them effectively prioritize? What was the moment when they went, okay, we're giving up. It's not working our way. We're going to try your, your way. It took half a year to get them wow. over to my way. But I came in, that, that was some of the demands that I made up front <laughs> when I joined the organization. I was like, guys, I'm happy to help, but here are my conditions. And I made the CTO, the COO, and the CEO sign off on those before I joined. And, and you, you and were a contractor, right? Uh, no, I was, on that one, I was actually a direct hire because the CTO said, hey, can we, can we work out a deal where we hire you for the next three years directly as an wow, okay. employee? Because they said, we can't afford your regular rates. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he said you'll bankrupt us. I said, okay, uh, I'll come with and and work directly for you guys. Wow! So, <laughs> so you yeah. were fighting an uphill battle there, uh, uh, quite clearly. How did all of that impact sort of the noise level in the organization? In the beginning, the noise level was really high because obviously the teams were a little demoralized. Mm-hmm. They were overworked. They hadn't gotten a cadence in place or a rhythm in place where they could deliver at a sustainable pace. And so just doing the prioritization, that alone, it took half a year, but I knew when it would happen that the noise level would cut down by about half. Now, did everybody come with? No, (laughs) but I got enough of the teams with and up what I call the aha curve that it significantly decreased the noise level in the organization. The other example that I have is the Singtel project from about 20 years ago. The stakeholder meeting was on Friday afternoons. There were over 42 people in attendance, plus the executive senior vice president. And there were over 400 stakeholders involved in the project. So one of the first things I did was come in and working with the um, executive VP. uh, I said, look, we need to cut the stakeholders down to a maximum of like 40. And he's like, what did we do with the other 360? I said, we'll, we'll do a newsletter and keep them in the loop. But I said, you can't have any more than 40 stakeholders total. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, what about the steering committee? The steering committee had like 38 people in it. I said, we need to get that down to eight. <laughs> and it took him about a week to get it down to 12. And he said, no, I absolutely have to have these 12. Here's here's why. So I agreed to 12. But by reducing the uh, stakeholder or the, yeah, the key core team down to 12 people, 
from the stakeholder perspective, in both of those cases, we reduce the noise by way over 90%. And you can actually measure that using the communications formula that we use Mm -hmm. in project management. And so you can demonstrate how that works. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I have them in the book. (laughs) So Um, it was massive reduction in noise. So our primary focus in today's interview is vision. Relate what we have just heard about prioritization and the examples you've given from your own work. Relate that back to vision. Oh, that's beautiful. I'll go right back to NPG. Their mission statement was from 1862. And, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I kid, I kid you not. And it was... If I remember right, if you printed out a normal letter size, U.S. paper size, it it filled the whole page. It was just paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. Uh And and that was one of the other things that I chased the leadership about at Nature Publishing Group. It was like, okay, guys, what's our vision? What is it that we're doing? And it was really interesting because Nature, of course, they have na- the, all these journals that they had in their portfolio, and they were like the premier journal. So that if you've been published in Nature magazine, there's a pretty good chance that you're on the list for getting Nobel Prizes, okay? And so it's that level. It's the top of the top of the top. And so I said, okay, great. What's their vision? And then they had another part of the organization. They owned Scientific American. And any of us who work in consulting or project management or travel a lot, all of us have probably seen Scientific American on the magazine rack at the airports. And so over time, we were able to distill all those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of words down to two phrases. And one of the exercises I did with the executives was just beautiful. I sat them all in a room together and there were four or five board members with, I put a blank regular size post-it note in front of them and I asked them to write down the vision statement. And all 12 of them wrote down what they thought was the vision statement. And when you put it up on the wall, not a single post-it note matched another post-it note. In fact, two people put up blanks because they didn't know. And this is your board. And I was just stunned. And so I said, okay, guys, we need to distill everything that you have up here on the board into something that we can use for the teams. And so we distilled it into two portfolios and we got it down to um, very short phrases. So for nature, our vision statement was science for scientists. And for uh, scientific American, our vision statement was science for non-scientists. So six, six, seven words. But then once we had that, we went back to the teams and product by product, team by team, we had them write their vision statements, linking their vision statements back to one or the other. And so from that point forward, everyone knew exactly what it was that we're working on. And for the Nature Journal side, that's science for scientists. And for Scientific American, that was science for non-scientists, like me. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And so that was it, it, that is the art of simplification. And this is what makes flow deceptively simple. But this is really hard to do. And it takes a lot of work to be able to facilitate the executives so that when they look at okay, what is our vision statement that they can actually distill it down? And a vision statement shouldn't be more than five to seven words. And it needs, so it needs to be short. It needs to be easy to communicate and it needs to be memorable. Here I'm sitting eight years later and I can rattle off those vision statements for those portfolios without even thinking. That's what you're shooting for 
with your vision statements? Yeah, I can tell you that I know exactly where to find the mission, vision, and core values of our company. Mm -hmm. I can probably give you the gist of them all. And awesome. I know the first core value by heart, uh, <laughs> but I could not write down our vision statement uh, if you forced me. I, I would I literally have to go to the website and look it up. Interesting. And I think men, that, that, that's probably true for, what, 95% of our listeners today as well? Yeah, I've only run into one company where we, I had 20 people in the room and 18 of them were able to write their vision statement word for word. But that was a German company. <laughs> right. Okay. I, I, so, I get that. Yeah, being Swiss, I, I, I see how, <laughs> how, that, how that would work there. Uh, yeah. So that's one of the powerful things about vision. Now, follow up to that. Six months later, had the leadership all in the room again, the same group, same 12 people, put the post-it notes in front of them, asked them to write those two statements. Every one of them could write it word for word. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. Once you have something that powerful and that simple, it becomes, becomes really easy. So do I get you right? Defining the vision is a core tenet of flow. Yes, okay. absolutely. And somehow you have to get this into the heads of everyone. What would you say to leaders that say, well, we can't afford to train our people. We can't, you know, get this out to them. Oh, we get that all the time. <laughs> of course. I, I mean, I, I know what the answer is <laughs> because I've, I've, I've come up with my own answer and, and I'll, I'll give you my answer afterwards. So, so let's see if, let's see if, if our answers meet and match. Uh, prob I'm, I'm suspecting that they probably do because I always chuckle and say, well, you know, there's the old joke about what if we train our people and they leave? Exactly. And the other one is, is well, what if we don't and they stay? And they stay. <laughs> then you have untrained people in your company and they work for you and they're really rubbish. So investing in your team is the number one thing you need to do. Exactly. Knowing farewell, they will leave at some point and your investment leaves with them. But while they're here, they have been trained and they worked for you. But you were supposed to answer this question, not me. So. <laughs> but we had the same answer, so that was beautiful. <laughs> well, and there's a, even a little bit of a follow-up to that, because even if they leave, do you want that person leaving as an advocate for your organization or somebody who is not an advocate for your organization? For me, I, you know, when I lost one of my scrum masters and she got promoted, I went to my boss and I said, look, if we only increase her salary 50%, we keep her because I know she has an offer that doubled her salary. And he goes, oh, we're not going to do that. She's not going to leave. <laughs> and I looked at him. I said, you're absolutely wrong. Mark my words. We will lose her. And so because they weren't willing to bring her up to even close to market rate, she was able to go out and double her salary. Right. But she left as an advocate for how I work with teams. And so I, it would have been great if she had been able to leave as an advocate for the organization, but she didn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's sort of that old, old adage, be nice to everybody on the way up because on the way down, you're going to meet a completely different group of people. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, it's, it's something along those lines of it's really good that even if the people are going to leave at some point in time, that they remember their time at your organization as one of those, wow, that was one of the best times of my life. And so that's what I'm shooting for in flow and in training people and building that loyalty among the team members, it's, it's, it's amazing to watch. So let's, let's go from the general training in a company down to the level of flow. How important and how vital is it to have my project team trained in flow? Well, it goes back to like the um, interview that I mentioned in the first one where 
the CIO came to the flow training, sent his people through the flow training, and was able to reap a 300% increase in their productivity in 90 days. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's absolutely vital uh, to the success because it's one thing to read it in the book, okay? It's another thing to take the quizzes online. It's a whole nother thing at the next flow certification that we have to do a case study. It's at that point when you can do a case study and you start taking the frameworks, models, tool sets, and mindset out of our books, and you start applying it to the real world that you're working with, it's at that point that people many, many times get that aha where they go, they, 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 their heads just snap and they go, whoa, this really works. And it's really fun to watch. And what about coaching and mentoring after the flow training because you know it's it's one thing going to a training and learning okay vision is important here's how you do the vision and here's how you relate this and here's how how flow works mm-hmm. then you go back and you know the phone rings and there you go <laughs> in one ear out the other <laughs> exactly and and on these assignments with which i worked last year that was the beauty of these assignments we walked in with myself and the agile coaches that were also flow certified professionals, we were able to train each team through that day and a half training each team and then the half day workshop. And then the agile coaches took over and did the coaching for them and immediately got them using everything that we just taught them in the previous week. So without that coaching mentoring follow-up or for somebody who's really lit up and on fire who takes it upon themselves to become that coach and mentor for their team. If that's not there, it becomes very difficult. It is as difficult as when you take traditional teams and try to switch them to agile because it takes a huge amount of discipline to do agile correctly. And it takes equally as much discipline to do flow right. It's, it's easy to understand. It's just not simple to do. Let me bring us back to the topic, which is the vision. And let's also try and relate this to our listeners, the project managers here. Mm-hmm. How does flow help us project managers, us project leaders, to communicate vision, strategy, mission and goals more effectively, more clearly. How, how does it support me in that with my project team? Ooh, that's a great question. By actually taking the time with the team to develop the vision for the project or product on which they're working, when the team has done that and they've put their vision up there, they have ownership for that. And If we've done our job correctly, they will have linked that vision to their department, to their division, to the entire organization, you know, right up and down the, the food chain. If it's all linked, by doing that, it helps the team keep focused on what is it that we actually have to deliver. Vision is like the ultimate definition. If you get that one right, then it makes your projects that much easier. And I can already hear the question within the question. And I can hear project managers out there right now saying, yeah, but, you know, in my company, first, nobody knows what the vision is. So what do I do then? (laughs) Okay. Yes, thank you for asking it. So I didn't have to. (laughs) Well, it's like this. I can give you a perfect example on the original project that's in in that case studies in flow as well. When we walked in there, that organization did not have a clear, crisp vision at that point in time. In fact, nobody could tell us what the vision was. So we got the team together and first we crafted the team vision. And then we used the wisdom of the group and we said, okay, what should the vision for this company be? And going through some distillation, 
with the team, they came to an agreed upon, yeah, this is what our vision should be. And so we linked the team's vision to that. And so even if your organization appears to have no vision whatsoever, (laughs) you can still use flow. And that particular project was really interesting because it was the first one ever using the beginning elements of flow. That company, because they had sunk so much money into the project before we got there and actually successfully delivered it, they had spent so much money on it. They said, look, internal audit's going to watch the results for a year and we're going to measure to see if this project delivered what it promised it was going to deliver. The internal audit team, which was outside the project team, they came back and they said, the contribution to the bottom line for this organization was $29.6 million net net. It's as if you increased our sales by like $300 million. And so that's when we realized that, oh, we might have something here. (laughs) And that was the origin of flow. And so that's why even in a situation where you're fighting an uphill battle or it feels like guerrilla warfare, vision is got to be your North Star that you use to filter everything. And and that guides your mission, it guides your strategies, and your goals, whether you're doing sprints or gates or whatever, you need to have a goal for every one of those. And if you have that, and the team is achieving that goal, that just really energizes the team and really gets them going. All right. To close out our interview today, how does a project leader, our listeners, best apply what we have learned today on our day-to-day work? Well, when they go back to work tomorrow, the first thing they should do is start digging out what is the vision for the organization, okay? And have I done the vision for my project? And if you haven't, it's never too late to start. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And just, just getting those things together will help you start pointing your team in the right direction, get them moving that way. And hopefully in the process, they'll actually start to enjoy it or even love it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andrew. Once again, the book is called Flow. Get Everyone Moving in the Right Direction and Loving It. It was written by Ted Coleman and Andrew Coleman. It's 239 pages long. Thank you for being here again today, Andrew. We appreciate it. Thank you, Cornelius. It was really great to be here. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Andrew Coleman is an enterprise and executive coach and author. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Please visit pm-podcast.com for show notes, links, transcripts, and PDU information. Our email address is info at pm-podcast.com. And finally, we have this. I know there is a well-documented project management body of knowledge somewhere, but I can't find it under this mess on my desk. Until next time.